outside the primary visual cortex and specifically will be sort of uh, giving you some uh, uh, stuff about motion processing and the motion processing pathways, but I just want to sort of uh, go back to the end of my talk uh, on uh, V1 just to uh, make sure that we everything uh, we sort of summarize things and understand what we Remember, I stopped the last uh, lecture talking about Campbell and Robson's stuff from uh, the 1960s, in which they uh, looked at the contrast sensitivity function, right, for the uh, sensitivity to different spatial frequencies. And what was nice about this is that we could see, uh, we, uh, we, we compared the contrast sensitivity when you're using square wave gratings versus sine wave gratings. And remember that, you know, when you talk about a square wave, the point was that if you think of a square wave and you build it to its Fourier components, then you're using the fundamental, okay, and then uh, a frequency which is three times the fundamental, five times the fundamental, so on and so forth. And here you can see just, you know, when you superimpose them, you know, using the fundamental and using 3F, 5F, and so on and so forth, you get a, to a better and better approximation of what the stimulus was, right? This is the whole idea of poor decomposition. Note two things here. First, you have to not just choose the right frequencies, but also the phase, right? So in this case, if you were to choose a different phase, you'd get a completely different response here, okay? So you have, as we said, for the Fourier analysis, you have the amplitude spectra, which tells you what is the modulation per frequency, but also the phase spectra which tells you what is the, the phase that you're using for the, the frequency, because you can shift the phase, you know, from zero to two uh, pi uh, degrees, right? And then so, and you need both uh, uh, types of information to reconstruct what the image is. And the point there was that, okay, you look at the psychophysics and you see that there's a difference between the performance when you're using a square wave and a sine wave. And you can understand that by the idea that we have channels for different frequencies, okay? And your psychophysics is governed by the output of these channels, right? That was the whole idea. And we saw that, okay, since in general here, performance is better for the square wave than the sine wave, and this is at a ratio of 4.4 divided by pi, which is exactly the difference of the fundamental amplitude versus in the square wave and the sine wave here. So this is just a reiteration of what we said before. And I sort of pointed out that this is not the case for the lower frequencies. And can give, someone give me the answer for that? Yeah. Why is that? You gave the answer for that. I gave, yeah. Just, I just want to make sure that we sort of follow this up and that everyone understood this. It's and the idea is what? It's not as uh, it's out of the range, but it's the, you're right. That the main frequency like you sensitivity is lower for the main frequency than for the. I'm sorry. You're, you're no, okay, no, I'm like no, no, but you're you're saying it right. Okay, that the main frequency. What you see here is actually like uh, the third and like the three F and not the F. Yes, because if you if you're going from let's say I think we had an example here. If you take uh, you know a spatial frequency, a low, very low spatial frequency, let's say a point two uh, cycles per degree. Okay, 3F would be at uh, 0 0.6 uh, cycles per degree, so maybe, uh, or let's take this one, 0.3 cycles per degree, approximately 0.3 cycles per degree, and this is 3F, which is around 1 cycle per degree. We'll consider that the change in, in the sensitivity is more than a factor of 3, right? And therefore, 3F will detect that there's a gradient there before 1F does. Although there's the, the amplitude, of 1F is three times the size of 3F. Okay, that was the point. Okay, uh, but these, these are details just to, uh, to uh, I think the, the beauty of this work was, and this was sheer psychophysics, okay, was that you have here a, sort of, uh, uh, a hypothesis before even, just one minute, before even recording from these cells that you're going to get bandwidth, you know, you're going to have neurons which are selected to a specific bandwidth of frequency. Okay, and orientation. Okay, and just to complement this, here's an example of this. Okay, so please now, you can fixate here and keep this above your fixation and this below your fixation. 
And let's do this for a, a few seconds here. Classical adaptation studies. Okay, so if you do this, and now look at this. Do you see a difference in terms of the size of this one and this one? It's probably faded away. But typically, if you adapt enough time, and maybe I did this too fast, if you adapt enough for this, you're going to see this as being a higher frequency than this one. Because here you have adapted to the high frequencies, here you have adapted to the low frequencies, and therefore you get a reversal. Okay? Between them? Now the idea here is that you keep this at the upper visual field and this is the lower visual field. And you don't have to focus specifically on a, bit, on a specific point. Okay, and so if you haven't uh, had this, you can try this at home. I assure you that you will, you, you will uh, get this uh, sort of uh, experience. And how do we understand this? Well, again, the way to think about this, here's, your, here's basically uh, your uh, channels, each one sensitive to a different spatial frequency. And the idea is very simple, right? I mean, so you adapt to a, a, a specific, uh, okay, in this case, you do not adapt. So you get, you know, the responses of different uh, channels here, okay? And basically, you give a, a stimulus, you get a pattern of activation for the different channels, depending on their sensitivity. So the ones which are more sensitive are going to be. That, that is the concept that they've met, okay? Now, we can talk about channels about uh, neurons which are sensitive to a specific range of frequencies, okay? And we see that, uh, and we've seen this before, remember? This is where we've ended, okay? That, no, this is a CSF, sorry. That you have neurons which are sensitive to different frequencies, you know, they have a specific bandwidth. And therefore, remember, again, from psychophysics, if you can adapt, you get an effect which is specific to the adapting frequency. It's not spread out, and you can actually get this sort of waveform in terms of you know, the, the effect of the, the, the tuning curve, if, I, if, if you will, of uh, the threshold elevation of the function of the spatial frequency in specific. Okay? And uh, basically, the point I wanted to make was okay, that you can predict this from sort of a population code, a very the basic population code, in which, okay, you give a certain test stimulus without any adaptation, you get a pattern of activity from these different channels here, okay? Channels corresponding more or less to, to the, 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 the bandwidth of individual neurons, okay? And now, but they did not mention this in terms of neurons, but they, they, they talked about channels, okay? And now, if you're going to use a sort of a low frequency adaptation, so if you're looking at a sinusoid of a low frequency for prolonged periods, what do you get? You get a decreased sensitivity of the channels or the neurons which are sensitive to that specific frequency and, and nearby. And therefore you get a decrease if you compare this one to that one, you get a decrease of the low frequencies. And therefore if you were to look at the output, you get the population output in terms of the vector of activity, what you're going to see is sort of a, a bias towards the higher fre spatial frequencies, correct? You follow because these ones are adapted. So you get a sort of a, if you're computing, you could compute sort of a mean there here, or just look, or look explicitly at the vector here, this would be sort of tilted to higher spatial frequencies. And similarly, similarly, if you are to do an adaptation with the high frequencies, you're going to adapt the high frequencies, leading to a change here in the distribution of the pattern of activity, so that it is shifted to both spatial frequencies. And this corresponds roughly, I mean, it's just sort of a rough portrayal of the idea, qualitative and not uh, uh, quantitative, of how could you explain adaptation in terms of these spatial frequency channels. Yes, and this is where I wanted to end, sort of, an, an addendum of what I didn't uh, have time to finish in uh, the, the last. Uh, so, if you have questions, that's the time before we move to the next. Uh, just one more question here. Why the a single tuning curve in the upper front is not a Gaussian, but you can uh, the shape is one right? Did you're asking a single, yeah, a single shape. You're, a single okay, curve. okay. So the question is, what is the axis here? Is this log scale? Ah, okay. Okay, or, it, or is this linear scale? Just log. And, 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 yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, but I do. Sure. yeah, yeah.
Okay? Uh, and just to sort of uh, finish this, so the idea is, we're talking about V1. The idea is that you have a, a stimulus. It could be a gradient, but usually it would be a picture of, say, say me. And you sort of think about this. This is like from the early 80s, uh, that you have sort of these filters. And, uh, and these filters are for different spatial frequencies and different orientations, right? And you have sort of the output of these filters, which is later sort of so you, you Remember what we talked about? You take this filter and you convolve the image with this filter, and that's the output of that filter. But you have to think about it that there's a nonlinearity, okay? So you can say, okay, the activity of the uh, cell, first of all, is like spiking, right? So you have to reach the uh, threshold to, to have a spike. Otherwise, you don't see an output here. So there should be sort of a, a, a minimal level at which, uh, of excitation at which the cells start to fire, and if you can think about this as sort of an fi curve, that is, how much input does it get, and what is the output of the uh, neuron, and it saturates eventually, right, because there's a limit to how much uh, firing can the cell generate, right, so you, uh, basic physiology, that there's, sort of, there, there's uh, a finite level of excitation that you get just because of uh, the uh, issues of the uh, recovery of the cells and uh, uh, following the spike, which takes some time, okay? So, and again, you can think about this, not getting into details, but okay, on top of that, there's noise, okay? So, and, and you sum up the output of all these filters to uh, uh, perceive something and make a decision. So that's a very simple, simplistic way of, think of in, thinking about this in terms of a multi-resolution model of spatial pattern sensitivity. Why don't you have internal connections between the kernel? You will, because that's a very, okay, I will get to that. That's, that's a very simplified model from, you know, back in the early days, okay? Well, let's expand a little about that, okay, in a few words. So this is sort of a more uh, recent stuff. Who's heard the talk by Matteo Carandini yesterday? Okay, so uh, sort of relates to that. Uh, okay, so the first thing to notice here, as you move beyond V1, what do you get? First of all, you get that the receptive fields are becoming bigger, right? They're becoming bigger. And they're sort of what you see here is what, what we call this uh, uh, change of the receptive field size as a function of eccentricity. So as you're moving from the center of gaze further and further out, receptive fields become bigger. And the slope is greater in higher order areas than in V1, okay? And that's sort of a portrayal of this in some schematic way, so that's sort of the receptive field size function of eccentricity in V1, and that will be the case in V4, with some overlap here, which is not, you, you do not see here, of course. And again, if we think about V1, you heard from a deep reading uh, Yuval and Weasel that the, about simple cell and complex cells, I didn't get into that at all, but just the idea is that you have a a simple cell, which is selective to orientation, certain spatial frequency, has an on area and an off area, okay? And you can think about this as, okay, this is a function of contrast, so you have an increase in firing if it's in the right phase, if it's off the wrong phase, you don't get much of an activity. This is, this is Matteo Carandini, one of his uh, uh, sort of reviews on this. And a complex cell is similar, but in a sense it's, it, it doesn't matter about the phase of the stimulus. That is what matters is the spatial frequency and the orientation, but the phase does not matter. So you sum up uh, uh, the information independent of the phase, see so the cell responds whether the phase is like that or like that. Same spatial frequency, just the difference of phase, right? And you uh, basically, so these are the outputs of a, a simple cell and a complex cell. And when you think about V1, here's just a schematic representation that you have for each position in space, you have a, a sort of a filter in different spatial frequencies and in different orientation, right? So this is sort of a representation of the specific spatial frequency and orientation in different positions in space, and you have this for all positions in space, and uh, you sum up uh, the information together, taking into account the correlation 
between one set of, of these uh, uh, filters and another. Okay? And uh, when you do that, this is the output that V2 gets. Okay? So just in a uh, two, three minutes, let's talk about V2 here. Okay, so what is different in V2 than in V1? Well, if you actually record the neurons, they're very similar in terms of uh, their uh, uh, selectivity. Although typically V2 has a bigger receptive field, that's just what I mentioned to you, than V1 of the, the order of the, you know, times two, times three, depending on eccentricity, but quite bigger. But there are some differences uh, uh, as well. And I just want to point one that's a recent, a recent work by uh, uh, Freeman and colleagues from uh, Nature Neuroscience, in which what they did is they, they've taken some, doesn't look uh, great here, but they've taken these textures here, like a beehive or whatever it is, and what they do is they act on mani manipulation to try to generate images which would be similar in their statistics so that V1 would not be able to tell one image from the other, okay? So what do I mean similar in the statistics? You take this image and, okay, you have a prediction of how V1's neurons would respond to that. You know, okay, you have these filters, different orientations and different spatial frequencies, right? Uh, and, uh, and you can uh, 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 look at these, uh, sort of the output of these filters and say, okay, let's generate an image which would generate the same activity in V1, okay? So you start from sort of a, um, a noisy image and you change it so that, okay, so you, in a sort of iterative way so that you get to a, a, a similar texture to the original one, which is indiscriminable in terms of V1. That's in terms of the model, okay? And now they can test this. So what they do is test this uh, by recording from neurons in V1 and V2, okay? So you compare this stimulus to that stimulus. We can tell this is a beehive, and this is not quite a beehive. But V1 is invisible to that. How do we see this? They've actually tested this, okay? So here's uh, different uh, neurons in V1, and they're using um, a stimulus which is what we call naturalistic, being the beehive or these uh, a phoneme, I don't know how to, huh? Beans, yeah, whatever. And so these look like naturalistic images, while well, these are, are not, right? And if you look at the responses of V1, they do not tell the difference between one and the other. But if you look at V2, you see that this naturalistic and the noise stimuli that have been in that computer but, I mean, generate a different response. Correct. It is. Oh, okay. so what do we what do we conclude? Correct. Okay. These are different. But V two gets all the information from V one, so something must be different in for all of V one. Well, you know. Okay. Everything comes from the retina. Okay. And <laughs> but still, but but still, uh, as you uh, sort of transcend in the hierarchy, there's a more and more sophistication of the uh, visual uh, image so that it becomes the optimal stimulus for that area. Well, it's not the case in earlier ones, okay? So you get cells in, in, in infratemporal so cortex the which are responsive to faces, and they are not so, okay? It's not the facial activity at the level of V1. So you're asking, how do you get? There are still cells that react in the same way, but it's just different cells now, that like the total receptive fields that you have in V1 in the first image and the second image are the same, it's just not in the same cells, and that's how it's integrated I mean, what, what are they they're not answering that question. I think you're right. They're asking, okay, how do you, uh, you find the studio for asking, how do you get this new capability to discriminate between a sort of naturalistic image and a, a noise image, noisy image, which looks quite the same, but not in terms of statistics, but indiscriminable in V1. How did you get that? They, they don't want to mention that. They say, okay. They measure the response. Okay, so I didn't get to that. But they're, they're, they're giving different stimuli, you know, which are the original stimuli and the stimuli which are following this iteration. And a lot of different cells that... Okay. Yes, yes. And, and looking, I mean, these are, here we're looking at three, you know, three examples. And you can see that in V2, you get a clear dif differentiation between naturalistic images and uh, noisy images. And in V1, you don't see any of that. 
Okay, so that was the point I was trying to make. And, and, and basically, if you look Which at that. for one cell, for many cells? So that, that's one cell, that's another cell, that's another cell. Here's 102 cells in which you don't see a difference between the two images. And in 103 cells in V2, where you do see a clear difference between the two. Okay, okay. so it just means there's a, maybe 100 more cells that generated this difference. I mean, we don't know about anything else that can be given with the V2. Oh, I don't quite follow it. Uh -oh. All I'm trying to point out here is that, okay, you have something de novo at V2, which you did not see in V1, okay? V1 cells are, do not discriminate between these two stimuli, while V2 do, and we do as well. We can tell which one is naturalistic and which one isn't, okay? So maybe, okay, there's no surprise that you have an analysis, just a few seconds, analysis beyond V1, of course we know that, okay? But that's just something to tell you about, okay, what is an exemplary, fu exemplary function of V2 compared to V1. That was the whole point I was trying to make. Okay? Yeah? There's no need to translate some question or concern. Uh, with the previous knowledge that all summation of V2 comes from V1. Okay, that's true. Last question was... I mean, not, not, not true. Not yes, that was the assumption. Yes. And that assumption, last question, was how do you... Well, how do you generate new features? Yes, how do you... How do you discriminate the two features if all information is all the same? How do you generate so, the two features? So, as I said, they have not answered that question, okay? It's not that they have a specific circuitry to explain how do you get the receptor field properties of V2 given the input from V1. That's a very complicated question. I don't think anyone, even for, you know, simple cell getting information from LGN, they've been arguing about that for, you know, the last 20, 30 years. Okay? Not to mention complex cell build-up from simple cells. So we don't have an answer to your question, okay? But it was just to show you that, okay, uh, you can see some specificity building up, you know, in V2 versus V1. And finally, and I'm not going to get into many details about this, uh, again, uh, I refer, uh, refer, referring to functional imaging, you can see the same sort of picture when you do functional imaging in humans. So here you look at, and I'm not going to get into the uh, details here, but there's different subjects, and you see a contrast between the naturalistic, the nat naturalistic images and the, uh, I can't quite see this, but the natural, say the beehive and the, the noisy image, which looks quite similar in terms of the V1 responses, and you look at, you know, the contrast between them with fMRI, and you don't get any activity with V1, that's in humans, of course, but you do see qu quite clear the uh, 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 distinctive activity at higher order areas which can tell a difference between the two. And of course we can as well. Okay? And this is just in three subjects. So that's the degree of modulation, meaning how much activity you get for one uh, uh, condition, the natural images versus the other. Okay? I haven't mentioned this because uh, I, I am taking too much time here. Uh, but I will take my time because it's important that you understand rather than me rushing about this. Okay, so here we see a modulation index. Modulation index meaning do you get a difference in response to the natural images versus the, the unnatural ones? You see here the two lines overlap, so there's no difference. Here there's a clear difference, and that would correspond to a modulation index which is bigger than zero, okay? And you see that in V2, most, of, uh, most neurons are shifted to the right, meaning that they respond better to the naturalistic images than the noisy images, while in V1, they're straight at zero. Is the cells that are recording from it? Hmm? If it's cells from it, that the receptive field is, uh, I don't know, is somewhere else, then obviously it is. If, 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 if it's cells whose receptive field is somewhere else, you're not going to get any response, right? So you have to place the stimulus within the receptive field, field of the cell and then start playing with a sort of the, the image identity, okay, which is what they found, okay? So that's not a problem, what you say. And the point I was trying to make is, okay, again, to show you functional imaging in humans using this non-directive uh, uh, method is not complete bullshit because you replicate the same sort of uh, finding that we had in humans using this uh, system. So you see that there's a uh, greater modulation when you compare them with the naturalistic and the noise in the image in V2 versus V1, and you see this also in the natural. And there's a lot more detail, but I don't want to get into that, because that's just to give you a general picture. That concludes basically what I wanted to say about last, uh, the last. Only the previous slide was the next of the other one, where? Yeah, one, two, 
electrophysiology in monkeys. Awake behaving monkeys. Yeah, okay, but we want to sort of move on to today's talk, which is going to be about visual motion analysis. Uh, so here we are, and so we are now expanding beyond, I, just, I gave you a, sort of a brief uh, picture of what's happening in V2, but we're expanding beyond uh, primary visual cortex. So this is sort of a Reiteration of the sort of anatomy of what I mentioned uh, before to you. So here we are. This is the monkey brain. Here's the eye of the monkey. Here's the monkey brain. Just to get ideas about sort of yeah, the eye is about yeah. Where's the mouse brain? Well, the mouse, you know, <laughs> nothing beyond. <laughs> yeah. So here's the monkey brain, and 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 just the color areas here. So sort of this is a, what we call a lateral view. So this is a, from the side. So these the colored areas are the visual areas. You can also look at what we call a medial view. So a medial view has two hemispheres. You look from the center at one of the uh, hemispheres here. So these are the visual areas in uh, a medial view. And you can get an idea, okay, and this is sort of the cortex when you flatten the cortex. So you take just like, the, you know, an atlas of the uh, uh, Earth you can sort of have an atlas, uh, although it's uh, a round globe. Uh, you can do the same thing by flattening, uh, sort of virtually flattening uh, the, the cortical map. And you can see here, okay, so this is the input from the retina to the LGN, V1, you, and you see the size of each uh, uh, area, visual area, and the colored ones are the ones which are involved in vision. So about, you know, in, in, in the rhesus monkey, it's about a third of cortex which is devoted to vision, uh, and so and this would be V1 would be in the posterior side, and then uh, you're moving sort of anterior. And here you see, just to give you again rough idea, brief idea about the patterns of connectivity. So here's V1, V2, and the sizes of each square or rectangle here correspond to the size of that area here. Okay. And the thickness of the lines is the degree of connectivity between yeah. one area and the other. So you're right, okay, V2 gets information mainly from V1, okay, but these lines, each line here is shown uh, as so sort of basically as bidirectional, as unidirectional, but in, in fact it's bidirectional. So you get the output from V2 going back, feeding back to V1. And similarly to, to V3, it gets input from. Uh, higher order areas such as V4, V3, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get into the whole sort of uh, wiring diagram here, but it's complicated as you can see. And we will uh, mention briefly something about feedback maybe in our next talk about, you know, feedback from higher order areas back to earlier areas, which is highly important. It seems. Although it was sort of, when people have talked about the hierarchy, typically they, initially they thought about this as sort of feed forward, sort of straight forward, forward uh, hierarchy. And of course, it's true for the first volley of responses. Okay, so of course you see a visual stimulus, the first responses are in the retina, then in the LG, and then V1, and it sort of goes up. Okay, so the first volley is indeed a feed forward one, but then the feedback uh, pathways kick in. So we will mention something about that as well. Yes? So uh, how do you define the areas of thickness from one another? Great, great question. Uh, basically, there's anatomical way to, uh, to do this in some cases, but in most cases, uh, this, okay, so the anatomy was used by Broadman in the you know early 20th century. Nowadays, we have uh, better techniques. One of them is the one I mentioned to you. When we talked about retinotopy, and we talked about the, remember that we talked about the rotating wedge. Well, typically, just in a minute, okay. If you look at the uh, uh, so you can see like that one finishes it to like V1. Yeah, well, okay, let me explain, okay? So if you uh, get to the border between V1 and V2, the neurons there are, uh, are uh, organized, the receptor fields are organized on the vertical meridian, okay? So just to explain what we mean by a vertical meridian. Okay, so, and you're not gonna see this. Sorry, we're gonna have to get the spin glass out of the way. Okay, so uh, just briefly, here's, here's cortex, your, your 
introducing uh, electrode into uh, V1 here. So let's say this is uh, V1 and sort of a folding, and, and this is where V1 ends and V2 begins, okay? And you have an electrode, and you move your electrode here, and somewhere here is the border between V1 and V2, okay? How do you know that? Well, if you're moving here, as you get to the border between V1 and V2, as I said, the neurons are going to sort of be uh, at the vertical meridian, okay? And if you record from a neuron V1, it's going to have, let's say, at the vertical meridian, it's going to be here, receptive field. And you move to V2, it may respond to the same orientation, and, uh, but it will typically have a much larger receptive field. So of the order of, you know, a factor of two or three or something like that. So you know in terms of where the border should be in terms of the horizontal vertical meridian, okay? And a change in size of the receptive field side is the best cue to know that you've moved from one to the other. And as you move from V2 to V3, it should be on the horizontal meridian and so on. So there's mapping principles, which I'm not going to get into, but have been known for quite some time in the physiology and have been replicated, as I mentioned last time, the retina copy done in, you know, functional imaging in humans. Okay? So that, that's covered. And, and we're going to talk about, okay, so this is sort of a, uh, a simplified um, scheme of the connections between uh, areas. It's, you know, typically there's like more than 30 uh, uh, visual areas in the macaque monkey. And, and here's maybe 10 of them. But it's just to illustrate there's two pathways, ventral pathway, dorsal pathway. You might, you might have heard about this. And we're going to sort of now look at the uh, area MT where uh, neurons are typically selected to uh, motion. So let's, and so we're talk, talking about sort of the dorsal pathway. Then we're going to talk about area MST and also area in the parietal cortex, okay, uh, which uh, get their information from this. Uh, from the area empty. Okay? Yes? Here we are. Okay. So maybe maybe this is something you've seen from at least showing you sort of a here's you blue weasel. So you don't hear you don't hear much because huh? that's uh, V1, isn't it? Yeah, that is V one. Yeah. So you do have some some neurons, but let me see if I can get this, the audio to work. Do you hear anything? Okay, so that's basically you're going to weave that. In V1, you're going to find it. You don't hear much, do you? Right? You do hear, maybe the audio is not. Okay, so you can change the direction for that tip, okay? Spontaneous activity of the cell. 
Okay? And here is the receptive field of the cell. So since it's contralateral, what would you say? Where was that the cell recorded? Hey guys, look at this. Okay, here, okay. So this is the, the receptive field is on in what side? The vis right visual field. Therefore, it was recorded in the left hemisphere. So the receptive fields are typically contralateral. Okay, so that's just to show you what the uh, tuning uh, curve looks like in, in, in a polar plot. Okay? And, okay, how do you build such a cell, uh, uh, a receptor which is sensitive to motion? Not that I'm dwelling to that too much, but just basically what you need at the level, if you think about, you know, Ganglion cells are photoreceptors. You need a, a, a cell which is responsive to one position in space and a cell in another position in space, right? And they should be not at the same position, but with some uh, difference between them. And the idea is that you want, you know, for instance, okay, you want the cell to be selective to a specific direction. So what you need is some cell, this one here, which is sort of, you can think about it, is it doing a summation. Okay, so you have cell A, cell B, okay, and this is the, and now I'm drawing the receptive field of cell A and cell B, okay, so there's some difference between the two, and, and they send, and this, okay, so this is the receptive field of them, of these two, and you have here uh, a summator, which has a, uh, which should have a bigger receptive field, so it gets input from both of these. It's not a face I'm drawing here, just a sort of mentioning the receptive field size of this one and that one. And in terms of sort of, you can think about, okay, now A and B are two cells here, and there's a wiring diagram in which, which is drawn here, okay? You need to introduce a delta T between the uh, activity in A, when does uh, the activity from A reach sigma here, which sums up the activity from A and B, okay, which is what we show here. And the idea for this to become direction selective, you want this summator here to sum up the activity from both A and B, and fire only if these are uh, arriving at the same time, okay? So this is sort of a coincidence detector, if you will, okay? And so, how is that going? Anyone can uh, help me? How is going to solve the problem here? What did I show here? Okay, similar to this. Delta, delta T is a delay. You need a delay line so that the time of arrival of information, if you have, okay, light arrives here, activating A. Then light arrives here, activating B. Okay? What would be the case? Now you want. Since this guy is sort of a, an AND gate, in terms of logical AND gate, meaning that you need a sort of coincidence of the two at the same time, you want to introduce a re, uh, delay here, which would correspond to what? To the fact that, okay, if the delay is here, this would be the preferred direction, because you first activated A, a spike started arriving here, but you're delaying it, and then B is activated later, right? And then like, here, they arrive at the same time. Okay, so this is very basic, yeah, a uh, very basic coincidence detection uh, mechanism, which would be selective to uh, a specific direction compared to the other. Of course, it would also be selective to what? To just light and medium. If you light this one alone, it's not going to be enough because you need the joint input from both of them. Okay, so that's not going to work. That's fine. But it is, it is also selected not just to the direction, but also to what? If you need light it for enough time, and also the other one, you just need uh, enough time for the lighting uh, to reach the end time to have the delta T. So if you have a constant similar of that light of the first one, and something that Right, so you need some adaptation. It should, be, it should be activated by the light onset. You're absolutely right. That, uh, if it's on, if A is B for infinite time, and then you like this, if A is on for an infinite time, and you like B, it will be activated, as I said here. So you need some decay. That, that, and that's right. But also delta T enforces another restriction here. 
And what is it? The velocity, right? Because uh, uh, delta t means, uh, the velocity is delta x plus delta t. So delta x meaning the distance in terms of uh, the receptor field between the two, okay? And delta t would mean what would be the optimal velocity. You, you're going to always have a preferred direction, but you have to have this at the right timing, okay? So that it would activate, you know, you know, put it this way, okay? You activate this, and immediately later you activate this one. You know, one microsecond after that. Well, that's not going to work because delta t here is much bigger than that. Okay, so you have to have the activation between the two, the delay in activation between the two in terms of the motion should correspond to your delta t. Okay, you're all with me, right? I mean, this is quite simple. Okay, uh, going on to okay, what is the problem that you may have? Sorry, how, the, how do you... Uh, you need different neurons, which I would have to talk about. That, uh, that's specific to a delta t, right? You're right. That you're asking, how do I solve this problem? Well, you're going to have a set of neurons, each having its own preferred direction and velocity. Now, the delta t could be such that it's a question of... Uh, how does, just specifically, how does one neuron apply this? Is this uh, like uh, one neuron and uh, one that is more myelinated than the other? Or well, first of all, the question is, okay, it, it's not that you need a, a, a very specific delta T because uh, the question is, okay, how much fuzziness do you allow to call this a coincidence, okay? So if, you know, this, you've activated this, okay, and it gets it one time, and you've activated this, it gets it another time. Well, what is the window that you allow yourself to say, okay, it's simultaneous? And that can change, okay? So that has to do with sort of the properties of integration of cells. I'm not getting into that, but basically you could play with that. So it doesn't have to be velocity specific in terms of a specific so speed. So it's not related to the path between the cells. But I mean, the first one five is directed to the end neuron. The, the, the summing, the summing yeah, neuron. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, that one uh, just has a different sensitivity to different. Uh, yeah. So I mean, th this is what I wanted to, uh, to basically portray here is just. In principle, how can you get from neurons which are not direction selective suddenly direction selectivity? And this is not like the most simplified model to explain direction selectivity. They know, okay? So, okay, say in the retina, you didn't have this direction selectivity, suddenly you have direction selectivity. How did you get it? I, I understand, like, it's like, like how did that facilitate uh, Okay, so not getting into that, but generally, yeah, that, the thought is that this is actually implemented, okay? And, 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 and it's been studied in other systems quite well, this issue of coincidence detection. But I'm not getting to that in, in, in great detail. Just one minute, because I want to sort of, one more thing before I, uh, we take a break. And that is the issue of the aperture problem. OK. Well, what's the problem? I've mentioned till now, OK, so we had a cell which is direction selective, and it had a certain receptor field, and in you know, the receptor field, as I said, in V1 are typically, in the rest of them, very small, and, and, and in V1 they're still quite small, and they're becoming bigger and bigger as you move from, uh, you know, V1 to MT to MST. Now I'm talking about direction selective uh, neurons. So they'd be direction selective, they prefer a, a sort of direction in specific direction, say this direction here, but it wouldn't matter where the direction would be, where the motion would be within the receptor field, okay? So you could use random dots and present them in different positions and you still get uh, uh, a response. And, okay, but you have a problem, especially when you have very small apertures. So think about V1 neurons that are very small, you're looking at the world through a very, very small aperture, which is the receptor field, right? Now, say that you're presenting sort of a, uh, this gradient, to this aperture, what would be the output? Well, if you have sort of, okay, so here's an aperture, and you're presenting, say, instead of a, a gradient, think about this as a bar. Can you see, or am I? Okay, so you have a, a, a relatively small receptor field, and you're presenting a bar. Okay, 
What can you tell? The bar is bigger than your aperture. What can you tell about its direction of motion? Well, you can say something about this direction, which is, which is uh, normal to the bar orientation, right? But is it this way? Is it this way? That you can't tell, right? Because if the bar is sort of moving also in this direction, if it's big enough, and you cannot judge it because the aperture is small, you have only this component in which you can judge direction. So you have a problem here in the sense of, and that is what's portrayed here, the aperture problem, you know that motion is in this direction fine, but you do not know if motion was this way or that way, right? But you can only uh, estimate the motion which is perpendicular to your bar direction, bar orientation. Everyone follows me here? How do you solve it? Well, another one way to think about this is, okay, let's say you take a, an object, maybe we'll show you just an example. That's you know, there's nothing better than an example. Where is that? Here you are. And this is something that the advice was involved with. Okay. What's the motion? Well, what's the direction of motion? Well, I would say this way, right? But what if you look at the, instead of one edge, at a corner? Ah. Now this seems to be a little different. Now, uh, let's see if I can... What, what about... Well, one, so. hmm. I'm trying to show you the full stimulus. Yeah, yeah, that would help. Thanks. Good point. How about a whole square? Ah! Okay. And just to show you that, okay, here you are, here's the whole square, okay? Same image, four edges. Cool, right? So, you follow me? If you're looking at one edge, you can only assess that direction of motion. Look at another edge, you can assess that direction of motion, okay? If you were to look at a corner, then you'd have no trouble, right? Telling the actual direction of motion, okay? Here's the full square, right? So that portrays the aperture problem quite well. So. You can solve the aperture problem in two ways. One is basically to follow the corner, right? The other would be... Where is the glass? I don't have my glasses. That's, that's, that's the problem here, but we will manage. The other is what you see here, and that's where I'm going to end. is what we call an intersection of constraints. And I've just showed you, okay, you have one aperture which can judge that direction of motion. So there's, you establish an intersection of constraints. The velocity could be in any of these vectors here, okay, because you don't know anything about, you know about this direction, but you don't know anything about that direction, okay? So that would be the uh, line of intersection, uh, of constraint line, induced by that aperture. Now if you have another aperture, and you know that this is a one body that's moving together, then you have another constraint from another aperture. And if you do the intersection of constraints, you get the actual vector, this vector of movement of the object. Now, there's another way to solve this. That, that's a possible way, but another way it would be to have some of an aperture here following the corner, as we mentioned. And even a simpler way to solve this is if you have an, uh, an aperture or a sensitivity, which is much bigger, right? So you see the whole object. Well, you see the whole object, you don't have the aperture problem anymore, okay? So we're going to be talking about MT, in which you find cells which have bigger receptor fields, okay? And there's some sort of integrating information uh, across uh, different positions in the receptor field, and we're going to use uh, random dot stimuli to uh, study this, okay? And we'll take a break now.
שתי מקומות, קוראים איזה דיליי ליין. כן, קוראים דיליי ליין בעצם. מה? אני יכול לדעת איך אינביט, אתה יכול לדעת סיטציה, אבל הקריט הוא שהחיבור פה, כאילו שאתה מסכן, שהוא מקבל פינטוסים משני ה... כן, כן, לא, אבל כאילו, זה לא, 
neurons in uh, area MT, which are uh, selective to direction, as I uh, mentioned before. And typically, this uh, work that's done by uh, Bill Newsom's group, like from, this is from the 90s. And what they've used is sort of a uh, random dot stimuli in which all the dots can move in one direction, and we call this 100% correlation, 100% coherence, or they could move randomly, and, and that would we call that zero coherence, and you could have, of course, any in-between condition which a certain proportion of the uh, dots move in one direction, the others move in the uh, random direction, and all the dots were uh, white on a uh, black uh, background, so there's no uh, white dots and black dots, but that's just for illustrative purposes here. And basically, I have a demo of that, but we'll skip that just for lack of time, I think it's quite understood. Basically, what uh, Newsom and uh, colleagues have done was basically uh, the question they had in mind was let's compare the performance of single neurons to that of a monkey. Okay, so they're taking a monkey and training him on a task w in which he has to detect and tell us which is the direction of motion. Okay, so you have the monkey fixating a fixation point, you present the stimulus at the receptive field of the cell. Okay, so for that reason, you have to uh, keep uh, uh, tracking the eye. So if you present the stimulus in the periphery, typically what you and me will do is move your eye to here. But then the uh, uh, receptive field of the cell would move in a corresponding way. So if you were to record the cell now and the monkey had made an eye movement to here, of course, you're not going to get any response from the cell, although the motion is still there. The reason being that it's now stimulus is outside the receptor field, okay? So you want to have the monkey maintain fixation here, and you present the stimulus for a certain time, typically one or two seconds here, 
And then what you train the monkey to do is tell us which was the direction of motion was it in one direction or the other uh, by uh, switching on these LEDs here and here. So if the motion was upwards, you have to, uh, the, the monkey's trained to make an eye movement to this uh, LED. And if the, if the motion was in the other direction, it has to make an eye movement to that LED. Okay? So that's just telling us it's up or down. The monkey can't say up or down. He sort of tells us what was his perception by making an eye movement. So it takes a while to train the monkeys to do so, but that's possible to teach them to do so. And uh, now you can play with a, a level of yeah. coherence, right? So, or what, what's called the dot correlation. So the dot correlation could be at the maximum of 100%. This is a log scale here. And here's the proportion correct of answers. So if it's 100% coherence, it's easy to tell if it's in one way or the other. I didn't mention another thing, which is important just to mention. The neurons are direction selective, and therefore, by having being direction selective, they have preferred axes and anal axes. So you find, for, you know, you, as you uh, place the electrode near this empty cell, you now sort of change the direction of motion to find what is the best direction of motion for that specific cell, and it would be different for different cells, and then you place the stimulus to be at that axis or the opposite, which we call anal axis. Okay? Yes. Yeah, because there is, each cell has a receptor field, okay? And the receptor field meaning that you have to present the stimulus in one position with respect to the fixation point, okay? And you have to maintain the stimulus at the cell's receptor field. Now, if you, the receptor field is defined in retinal coordinates, right? So if, if here's the fixation, here's one cell that has a receptor field. If you're going to move your, fixa your, fixa your center of gaze to the stimulus here, well, the receptor field is going to move correspondingly and be in here, okay? Because that's sort of a, a the receptor field is with respect to the center of case. So that's the point. Okay. Great. So specifically, what you can see is that you can sort of uh, see that okay, performance degrades as you're decreasing the signal strength. So as you're moving to uh, lower and lower correlation levels, performance uh, uh, drops and it should get to. 50% uh, when you're just guessing because it's just two directions of motion. Okay, so on each trial, the monkey has to say which is the direction of motion that he uh, sees and report that. Uh, okay, now what about the neurons? Well, the neurons are, uh, I told you that the neuron is direction selective, and by definition, if it's direction selective, it would fire more spikes. Okay, so let's look what we have here. This is the response of a specific cell, okay? And what you have here is a distribution. The white distribution is for uh, motion in the preferred direction. The black distribution is for the null direction. Okay? And what you see here are different levels of coherence. So you start from a relatively high uh, coherence. So it's easy to say that the dots move one in one direction versus the other. And here's the distribution of, uh, of the sort of firing rate per different trials. Okay? So on different trials, the cell is a noisy Sort of instrument. It doesn't respond, you give the same stimulus, but it doesn't respond exactly the same on a trial by trial basis. Okay? So there's some, uh, there's a, a mean firing rate, which is higher for the preferred direction than another direction, but there's some distribution, right? And what is the problem? The problem is accentuated if you have greater and greater overlap between these two distributions, right? So as you're moving to lower and lower signals, so you're moving from 12% coherence, meaning that 12% of the dots move in one direction and the others move in a uh, random direction. And as you're moving to lower and lower coherence levels, you see that these two distributions, the, the uh, degree of overlap between these two distributions becomes bigger and bigger. And one can analyze this using what we call an ROC analysis. Receiver, receiver operating uh, curve. I think I did mention this to you like uh, two yeah, weeks ago. We, yeah, but we didn't talk about the explicit the ROC curve. I just uh, <coughs> the, the principle of signal detection theory. Okay, uh, so we'll do this now, just for very briefly, if you understand this uh, basic principle that has been sort of implemented here. Yes, one one. one one thing at a time. What we're measuring here, what I showed you before, was a spike rate of a single neuron to motion the preferred direction in the white bars or motion in another direction, which is in the dark bars. Okay?
Okay? So do you see that... No, the dots, uh, as, as I mentioned, the dots, they have a certain coherence. So some of the dots move randomly, but there's a fraction of the dots that move in a coherent fashion. And if, let's say, here you have 12.8, that means like, let's say you have 100 dots, the 13 of them move in a coherent fashion. They may, may move in a preferred direction or in a null direction, but only 13% of them, okay? And if they move in a preferred direction, that's the sort of firing that you get. Again, the cell does not respond always in the same way, but there's a degree of noise in the system that, it's ma that is manifest in this distribution here. And if it's in another direction, that is the distribution. Okay, and now what I'm trying to see is now to use what we call the ROC analysis to sort of estimate how good is the cell in discri discriminating one direction from the other. Okay, so let's just think. Let's, okay, and the, the intuition is the following. As you move to lower and lower percent signal change, the degree of overlap between the two distributions becomes bigger. And therefore, to tell if it was in the, if you were in the other room listening to the output of this cell, okay, and and, and here uh, you you could sort of apply some criteria. Let's say if it was above 50 spikes per second, you say I was in the direct in the correct direction. If it was below 50 spikes, you say I was in another direction. But if you move here. That's, you know, you have a greater and greater problem. If you can think about this when you're sort of applying ROC analysis, it's the following. You're saying, okay, let's change the criterion in which I decide if the direction of emotion was in the preferred, in the null, in a sort of, in a graded fashion. So let's say we start from here. We say, okay, if, if the firing was above 100 spikes, I'll say that it was in the preferred direction. If it was below 100 sides, I'll say it was in another direction. What would be the case here? I would always say that it was in another direction, right? Okay? So, so I'll have, okay, so if you're plotting here, the time you'll say that uh, the preferred direction was uh, uh, greater than the criterion as a function of the null being greater than the criterion. Here, Okay, none of them are going to be uh, greater than criteria, right? The criteria is set at a very high level. So neither of them the preferred nor the null direction are going to be are going to pass criteria. But as I'm changing, moving here and here, so I'm laxing my criteria, what am I going to get? You guys got to follow this and explain to me. What, 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 am I, what am I getting as I'm laxing here the criteria? Okay, Daniel? Uh, yes. Yeah. And it is indeed, right? Because you're just sampling now the white bars, okay? So right now you're increasing the level. So this is hit, and this would be false alarm. So you're increasing your hit rate, okay? While not paying in terms of, of uh, false alarm rates. But as I go, go, okay, suddenly now I get to a level. Okay, so this would increase here. And then suddenly when we get here, okay, you're starting to have a false alarm because now that is about criteria as well, right? And so you will be moving along so a trajectory here as you uh, move your criteria and you lack your criteria. And what do you, when you get to here, what, what is the case? You, all, you, you, all, you always have faith as well, right? Yeah. So you get to that point of one and one here, okay? And now you can think about it. What, if you were uh, random performance, where would you be in a random performance? If the two distributions overlap completely. Along the diagonal, perfect, right? You're going to increase both, since they overlap, you're going to increase both at the same level, right? So the diagonal is random performance. And you can now say, okay, how, if you take this integral, how better am I doing compared to random performance? So that would be a performance of 50%. And if you take the integral, you can actually compute how well does the uh, neuron do, irrespective of the criteria. And that is the idea here. It's similar to the D prime value that we saw. It's exactly, it's not similar, it's exactly the same thing. D prime, just to get an idea, D prime is a measure of the difference between the two means with respect to standard deviation. Now usually when it's applied, what you probably saw with 
uh, at B is when you assume that the two distributions are perfectly Gaussian, normal distribution with a similar standard deviation. Uh, that's the easy uh, case. And then the arrow seeker would be symmetric to look, look to something like that. Okay? Oh, this is not quite uh, a perfect Gaussian distribution. It's quite nice, but it's not uh, quite a perfect distribution. What shapes this? Like why, uh, why is this different than that? I'll ask you that. Okay. Anyone can answer me? What in the experiment makes it different? Yeah, in the experiment, yes. You said earlier that it's different from dots that uh, have the same orientation and direction. Like, like they don't have orientation, they have a direction. Direction, not one, but I mean direction, yeah. That's 0.8% of the dots in that. corresponds to the signal that you have, the motion signal that, that you have. The weaker the motion signal, of course, the more difficult it is to tell if it's in one direction or the other. Okay? So, when you apply this, uh, you can uh, basically now compute what's called a neurometric function. Okay? So, that would uh, correspond to the self-performance as a function of the level uh, of the that would be sort of the coherence level. How many dots move in a coherent fashion? And you can go from 100, this is again a logarithmic scale, and you get the dots here, and you can uh, sort of use a sort of a wavelength function to approximate this and get a threshold which is at 82%. Never mind the details. But what's important is that you can get a threshold here for the monkey's behavior, and you can get a threshold here for the cell behavior. And lo and behold, these are quite similar, right? If not, the cells are even better than the monkey. Here's a few other uh, examples. And so sometimes the cell is as good as the monkey, sometimes the monkey is better than the cell, but sometimes the cell is way better than the monkey. And on average, the cells are as good as the monkey. Okay, so here you can plot the threshold uh, ratio between a neuron and the behavior. And if it were one, it would mean that the cell is as good as the, the monkey. If it's more than that, it means that the monkey is uh, more sensitive, but there's quite a few cells which are below one, meaning that, okay, the average threshold is, the average neuron is slightly worse than the behavior. But that is very surprising, right? Okay, and that's another way to show this. Never mind the details here. Skip that. Okay, that, but, but uh, I want to say, say first that this is extremely surprising, right? I mean, how could a neuron, an individual neuron, be as good as the monkey if the monkey is averaging across millions of, of neurons to take a decision, right? Think about this in the background. I'll mention another fact here, which is interesting. Now, you could use a case in which the ramp is completely random. So the motion is completely random, okay? Still, the monkey would decide, okay, he has to decide is it upward or downward, okay? Is it in the preferred direction or in the null direction, okay? And the monkey will decide, okay? And the question is, at the same time, you're recording from the neuron. And you can ask yourself, okay, what happens to the neuron, okay? And now, so this is for zero correlation, motion is completely random here, and you look here, so you, you plot here, the uh, uh, gray dots are when the, mon the monkey said that motion was in a null direction, and uh, white dots are when the monkey said that the, the motion was in a uh, preferred direction, although motion was completely random, okay? So it's just reflecting the monkey's decision, just one minute, not the physical signal. And surprise, surprise, you find that, uh, this is just the distribution here, you can see here that most of the white dots are above the black dots, right? Suggesting that there's information at the level of a single neuron about the monkey's decision. Physical stimulus is always the same here, right? That's extremely surprising again, because you're saying, okay, we all think that, you know, decision is not made by one neuron. And we have good reasons to think it is. Why? Because if you kill that specific neuron, which happens sometimes, you know, due to the lots of sort of moving and penetrating the neuron, the monkey doesn't stop you uh, responding, okay? So, so it might just mean that another neuron takes the... Uh, oh, so, so clearly, at least, there's another neuron that can take its place. And I, I can just know that there's another answer to that, okay? At least a partial answer to this. And, and, and mind you, this is something, I'm telling you of history here, because this is, I actually did this work like 20-something years ago with Bill Wilson at the time. And so, and the way we thought about it is the following. You may have uh, the, uh, heard uh, yesterday, uh, in yesterday's talk, 
Uh, pairwise correlations were mentioned, right? And I say that, okay, pairwise correlations are the one, pairwise is between neurons. It's the correlation between two neurons which matters here. And, uh, and, and before I start this, let's go back and think about this. Well, you would say, okay, if I were to use, instead of one neuron, a million neurons, how much better should I get? Okay? And this is dependent on the correlations. Well, if they're independent, if the neurons are independent of one another, it's just like you're trying to estimate, we said that the problem was the following. The problem was that you're getting the same response, same stimulus, and you get a, a certain response. And there's a Gaussian distribution of this response. So, okay, the firing may be, I don't know, 25 spikes, but it could be 30 spikes, it could be 20 spikes, okay? Although you've given the same stimulus, right? So the, you said the cell is a noisy, the problem is, the cell is a noisy creature. It doesn't fire exactly the same, and this is for the preferred direction. If you did this for the null direction, you got something else, and that's some overlap between these two distributions, right? That was the logic that we developed. Now saying, okay, say that instead of one cell, you have a million cells. And say that they're exactly the same. Okay, they have the same sort of uh, pattern of uh, uh, preference, and exactly the same sort of uh, uh, noise incorporated. How much better are you going to get by using a million cells rather than one? And I'm saying it's related to the pairwise correlation between the two. Let's take the extreme case, where they exact duplicates of one another, and they do, they're completely correlated. Completely correlated. What would be the case? So, again, so, so here's one cell, here's another. Completely correlated, meaning whenever neuron one fires above its mean, Neuron 2 fires above its mean, okay? And they're aligned along a, a straight line here, okay? So that you do not get any information by the fact that neuron 2 has fired because it replicates exactly what happened in neuron 1, including its noise. Now, if they're completely uncorrelated, you do have. Uh, how, much, uh, how much information gain do you get? I it depends, it depends on the number of neurons, and it depends on the number of neurons. Yeah, it's the law, of, exactly. It's, it's the law of large numbers in statistics, meaning that it depends on a square root of n, right, if they're independent. And indeed, okay, that is the case. So, the, you know, we came up with a very simple idea, and that is, okay, you have a, a pool of neurons which signal up direction, another pool of neurons which signal the down direction, and you compare these two, and come to a decision based on which one is stronger, this one or that one. And then you have to decide if it's up or down. Very basic uh, binary decision. Okay, now, sort of this is sort of a, uh, a, a formal uh, application of the logic or the intuition I tried to give you, is how much you're gonna get in terms of your signal to noise of this decision, which sums up information from this one and this one, if the neurons are correlated to one another, or let's say, first let's start with the case where they're completely uncorrelated. Correlation coefficient being zero. So that is the graph here, and if you see, as you're growing from one neuron to 100 neurons to 10,000 neurons, okay, the signal to noise, meaning the, the basically the summator here, that, the, the, yeah, basically you're, you're computing here, if you want mu, divided by sigma, by, by the sigma, which is the signal to noise, that's the SNR you're talking about, okay? And so, you're trying, if, you, if they're uncorrelated, then you'll get, if you're gonna use a million neurons, it will look like that, right? The sum of them, right? Because the sum, or the, the average of them is gonna still be 25, but the, the, this, uh, the variance is gonna be much smaller, and the standard deviation is gonna draw, uh, drop by the square root of n, right? That's what's portrayed here, okay? That for r equals uh, zero, so you're gaining for every increase of a uh, hundredfold increase of uh, neurons, you're getting a increase of the signal uh, to noise uh, ratio by a factor of 10, okay? And so for a million, you're gonna get an, an increase of a factor of 1,000. However, what if the neurons are slightly correlated well, I'm not going to get into the math of how we computed this, but it's uh, we meaning Mike Shannon who worked with me uh, on, on this. But he's sort of, uh, it's relatively simple to show, and I'm not going to get into this, but 
that you know, as you, even if you have very low correlation between the two neurons, which you see here, what would be a uh, zero correlation? How should the cloud here look like? Just as we know, a left, a, a sort of a, an ellipsoid, which is sort of uh, not aligned in, on, on some axis here, right? Just so you get a. So this is sort of the, the R value that we found on neurons was of the order of 0.1. Very low correlation, hardly detectable, right? But still, if you have a very low correlation, you can see that, okay, by the time you're pulling more and more neurons, the information you get from adding more neurons is marginal and basically asymptotes, okay? So you don't get much in terms of your signal to noise as you increase the number of neurons, okay? So that's one. Uh, issue here that you say, ah, there's a pairwise correlation between the neurons, and therefore you do not gain much by uh, summing many of them. And also, you can think about this. Okay, I, I talked about another phenomenon which was very surprising, and that was that if you look at the individual neuron and you see that sort of fluctuations in its response from trial to trial, it corresponds to the monkey's behavior. Again, suggesting that there's very few neurons that uh, that this decision is based on. Okay, but then again. If you look at the correlations, okay, and you ask, okay, how much of the fluctuations of the individual neuron is going to fit into that pool of neurons? Okay, and that also, uh, if the R would be zero, that would drop, you know, an asymptote to uh, basically uh, zero, cor no correlation, you know, in, in with this function. But if you have a uh, some uh, co pairwise correlation between each two neurons, and even if it's very weak of the order of 0.1, you're at that domain here, by, drawn here by the hatched line, okay? So you're going to still see something, uh, a correlation between the individual neuron and the pool of neurons. And the, we think that the pool of neurons is responsible for decision, okay? So decision is governed by the pool of neurons. And the fact that you have some correlation between the individual neuron and the pool of neurons means that you're going to see a correlation between the individual neuron and the monkey's behavior. Okay? And that is maintained, although you are pooling not across one neuron or 10 neurons or 100 neurons, but if you could be pooling across a million neurons because this asymptote here, added asymptotes here. Okay? So that was the point. I mean, this is sort of, we still have to be uh, fair. There's still a problem that, you know, I said that the individual neuron was as good as behavior, and if you're pulling, say, a million neurons with R equals 1 point, uh, 0 0.1, you're still a factor of two or three better than the individual neuron. But you're not talking about a, fa a factor of 10,000 or a million, okay? You're talking about a factor of two, okay, we can live with that, okay? So that explains most of the uh, uh, problem that we uh, 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 brought up, okay? So, although, to summarize this part, although you see that the, the neuronal behavior is very similar to the monkey's behavior, we do not think that this is due to the fact that the monkey is listening to individual neurons or very small numbers of neurons. No, in all likelihood, he is pooling across many, many neurons, but you do not get much from pooling across many, many neurons. And that is the result. And that is why you see these uh, two phenomena that I mentioned. Okay, and I want to get to another technique which was again developed in the 90s, 1990s, uh, and applied by uh, Bill Newsom beautifully, and, and uh, I think there's, you will hear, I think, from Adi later that this sort of technique has taken a, a different route in the uh, uh, last uh, 10 years or so, but it's based on the same idea, and that is, okay, we've seen till now that the neurons were very sensitive, try to explain that. But the question that one wonders, not only that they're sensitive, but they're also predictive of the monkey's behavior. But there's a, uh, a question of, we have only shown correlation. We have shown that when the, when the cell fires above its mean, that the monkey tends to choose, say, the preferred direction. If it's below its mean, chooses the, another direction. But that does not show causality, right? Causality is only, can only be shown if you're activating these neurons and you can see the, the outcome of that activation. And this is what optogenetics is all about, okay? Now, optogenetics was developed after electrical microstimulation has been used, okay? And electrical, initially electrical microstimulation was sort of uh, applied in the 50s to 
map what is the function of different areas of you know uh, sort of so you, let's say you stimulate motor cortex in one area and you get a twitch muscle twitch in one area you do this in another you get a leg twitch or whatever okay but here we're going to say talk about something more fancy in the sense that you're stimulating a specific region in sensory cortex and you can predict what the sensory outcome of that will be and okay when is it going to work so now you're, you're inserting an electrode and you're passing uh, currents through this electrode so that you're uh, now activating group of neurons, groups of neurons, say, you know, hundreds of thousands of neurons near the electrode. Non-discriminate. Okay? When is it going to work? Now, uh, we, we, okay, we're talking empty cells are direction selected. Okay? So you, you're, you, you know, you want to you want to think about how you, you, the logic of your experiment, right? So you're not going to test color vision if you're stimulating empty cells, okay? You're going to test motion selectivity, right? That's all. But that's not enough. You also need something about, to know something about the fine structural anatomy. What should you have? And this is related to what you heard about, you know, I suppose, from Yubo and Weasel and from uh, uh, at these lectures. You need kilometer organization. And why is that? Because you want to activate neurons which have, are somewhat homogeneous, right? That they all have a same preferred direction, okay? Now, it's nice that, you know, what we see in V1, for orientation tuning, you also find an empty in, uh, for direction tuning. So here you move the electrode track, and this is, again, from the 80s or something like that by John Allman, and you see that if you record, so this is the direction of preferred the direction of a cell as a function of the electrode track distance, and you don't record here 14,000 cells, you record them one at a time, okay? And you move your left of the bit, and you record the next one, and so on and so forth. And you see that, you know, along a, a very long patch of uh, uh, cortex here, for hundreds of microns, that uh, preferred direction does not change much, suggesting that there's a kilometer organization, right? I mean, if it were random, then the, you, you would be clueless, right? But since it does not change much, you can say, ah, here, if I were to place my electrode somewhere here, okay, I would activate cells which all have a very similar uh, preferred direction, right? So you're, you're targeting an area which has a preferred, a specific per, uh, preferred direction, and now you're doing the following. You're not just stimulating, presenting a visual stimulus. Okay, so one thing at a time. You have a fixation point. You find where the receptor field of the cells are. Okay, so here's the receptor field of, of these cells next to the electrode. And now, the, cell, the cells all have a very similar receptor field. And not just in terms of overlapping receptor field in terms of position, but also in terms of the direction of motion, the preferred direction of motion. Okay, and now, you present the stimulus in the, re the receptor field, but in parallel to that, you're also activating the cells through the electrode. So think about that. Here's cortex here. You advance your electrode and you map basically the receptor field of nearby neurons and you find that they all have the same, very similar preferred direction. You place your electrode in a place where you're at the center here where you're going to activate all these cells, right? So, and hopefully a homogeneous uh, population of cells all having the same preferred direction. And now, as you present the, the visual stimulus, you uh, activate the cells by passing a current through this uh, electrode. Okay, what do you expect to get? I told you all the details. What do you expect to get? Ooh, what are you showing them? You're showing a visual stimulus, random dots. Let's start with the case where it's completely random dots. What do you mean there will be a preferred direction? There will be a, a choice. Exactly. The monkey will choose the direction corresponding to the preferred direction of the cells. Why? Because you're activating these cells electrically, electrically rather than through the visual stimulus. Okay? But the cells don't know. The only know is, okay, you know, you can think about this. The cells are just either active or inactive. And when they're active, the element of causality, if their activity reflects the fact that the monkey will say that the uh, that motion was in one direction versus the other, then you should see this, right? So that's the idea. That's only if one code is bring to the 
right? Okay, great. Okay, okay, okay. So there's, there's quite a few caveats here. Just one minute. Okay, first, you're activating this group of cells. Well, who knows, maybe. Who, who says that, okay, there are typically many, many columns of cells, okay? Uh, selective to a specific uh, preferred direction. There's also multiple areas that are selective to motion. So it's not just MP, it's MSP. We've mentioned something that we didn't mention. V3, there's multiple areas, okay? And you're just activating one column. Well, who says that you're going to get much of an effect? But if you do, that's bingo. If you don't, well, maybe you should you have in parallel another electric another and sort of uh, basically stimulating another column which corresponds to the same preferred direction. But, okay, the point is, is that it was bingo in their case in the sense that they always got an effect so that, let's look at one example here. So here, the y-axis corresponds to the correlation, dot correlation. Positive meaning that the dots move in the, in the preferred direction. Negative meaning that they move in the null direction. Okay? And the y-axis here is proportion preferred decision. So it's not correct decision. It's the monkey deciding that the, uh, the, the motion was in the preferred direction of the cells. Now let's think about the extreme cases. Here's one example of another four different experiments. Let's just focus on one, it's the same thing. Two things to notice. Okay, if you were uh, sort of presenting a stimulus as zero correlation, random motion totally, and you're stimulating the cells to the microelectrode, electrically stimulating, you're getting, getting a major effect, right? So the uh, choices are rapidly sort of uh, increased towards the preferred direction, okay? And in general, let's look at the extreme cases. Well, in the extreme cases, you don't expect to get a great effect. Why? Because let's say, let's take the minus 100% uh, coherence. In that case, okay, the visual stimulus is dominant, okay? It's not, okay, you're stimulating one column of MT. Now you're showing the visual stimulus. Let's say the visual stimulus, all the uh, dots move in the null direction. You're stimulating also a column which uh, has uh, and elevating the activity of neurons whose preferred direction is in the opposite direction. What would be the outcome? Well, if the visual stimulus is the dominant one, then it's going to still, you're going to say, ah, motion was in the null direction. Where would you see the greatest effect? Well, the visual stimulus does not carry any information. So at zero, there's no informa visual information, right? But if, it, if the visual stimulus is, is very dominant or very pronounced, then you're not going to get much in the way. Typically, you see that the effect of microstimulation is a shift leftward of this curve, okay? And the greatest effect is when the visual stimulus is, is, is very weak or, or non-existent. Uh, that, that is, uh, the visual stimulus is just random motion whatsoever. And I don't have much time, so I'll rush through this. Okay, basically, there's a, a few more points that I want to mention, and that it really depends on where you place your electrode. Why does it depend on where you place your electrode? Because you have to, and this was done blindly, right? So you want to sort of select a, a group of neurons that are homogeneous. And, if you're, and you're just, you just know what's going on in one axis here. Well, you don't know what's happening with the cells which are here or inside, yeah, okay? Usually, yeah, if you go normal to the white man, to, to basically to the uh, um, cortex, then you typically stay within one column and your, your chances are better. But you don't know where, you, since empty is folded and inside, you cannot do this, okay? So you don't know what your trajectory is, okay? So basically, you, you get uh, dependence on uh, the uh, uh, position of the uh, electro and, and, and a couple of other things that's interesting as well I mean if you now have a fixation point and you present the stimulus okay the point is the following you're stimulating a group of neurons right and now uh, you present the, uh, the visual stimulus you can present the visual stimulus in the receptor field or in another position okay so if you present the stimuli inside the neuron's receptor field, okay, then 
you get a, a clear microstimulation effect. You see here the black dots here, which correspond to the microstimulation, white dots are the really microstimulation, and you see the clear gray shift that you have a major uh, effect of the microstimulation. However, if now you're activating cells which correspond to one position, but the monkey has to decide about vision, uh, about motion.